can you hear me? Is that working? Because it shows that the battery is probably very low, so it's not going to last for too long. And I don't know where to find batteries here. OK. <laughs> she knows, yeah, that's right. I don't know whether she's around or whether she runs a long distance to come here. I, I feel so sorry for her every time she comes. I mean, she's like sweating and everything. Yeah. OK, um, one question for you. Have you all looked at uh, Canvas to look at the material I put there for the previous two lectures? I have included the recording of the previous two lectures for those of you who want to go over the things we discussed in class. And if that works every time, so those recordings, I will place them for your information. Um, I also made available the first homework. And I gave, did you check it out? OK, those of you who have, there are two parts in this homework. One is a group homework. The other is an individual homework. The group homeworks, um, your group leader will have the responsibility to upload them. I suggest you, as a group, talk among yourselves on how best to solve the problems together. Sometimes people do it online. Um, sometimes they meet in the library. Well, so it's up to you on how your team wants to work. But I suggest do not wa wait until the last minute to be able to um, meet your team. Of course, you have met here in class, so you know who are the other members of your team. Since you are here, before you leave today, get um, arranged for you to come together as a team to solve this problem. They, um, so for that, your group leader or somebody else, if your group leader cannot do that, somebody then needs to be appointed to upload the homework. And all of you will get the same grade for the group homework. The individual homework, you do it individually. And then you will upload it in PDF form individually. All right? Is that clear on how we will do it? OK. Um, so just on the homework, one more point. What I gave you as a home, I, I sub sent to you via Canvas last time some more information about charges inside conducting spheres when the sphere is not grounded and when the sphere is grounded. You will need to look at that before you solve your problem. All right, this is going to be important to look at this information before you start solving the problem. And I have also uh, placed on your homework the points that go to each question. But the questions are building up. So if you do, say, the first one, then the third, uh, the second, third, and so forth, you will see they are not different, totally different questions. They are two different problems. And they are not on different topics, obviously, the group and the individual. But I will solve the group problem first, and then I will go to the individual. Tomorrow, uh, we are going to have our first problem-solving session. And um, what I saw from those who, I want to thank those of you who went to Tap Hat and filled out the uh, question about which are the best times. And uh, the best we could do is to find a classroom for 40 people. Uh, but I will be there tomorrow, and it's going to be Git one. Um, one zero zero. So tomorrow, which is October ninth, is going to be the first first problem solving session, and we'll have it every Tuesday. And it's going to be in one thousand six Git. I think I write it well. Hall. And I will be there from th solving problems from 3.10 to 5. And so I know if I were to put the two times together, most of many of you will be able to come. If you cannot come for because of conflicts with your other classes, please ask 
one person from your team to be there. And then you can share, he or she can share the information with the rest of you. Okay? Yes, uh, any questions? Yes. Yes, in that case, I will um, give something for everybody to do it who cannot come there because of conflict. So it's not going to be a survey as I used to do in the past, but it's going to be something related, <laughs> something simple. I, will f I need to figure it out. So as long as you will be able to answer this question if you go over the material, that's the key point. And I will give you enough time to go take the material from others, read it, and then try to answer the question. How about that? Because the, the only reason I'm doing it is to give you enough, um, I, I need to give you enough um, credit for going over the material, which of course is going to be good for you, all right, to be able to learn that material, and then for taking the time to fill out the survey. It's not going to be exactly a survey, it's going to be, I don't want to call it whatever, an assignment, a short assignment just to show that you have covered the material. I would not normally do that if the classroom was big enough for students to come, but uh, it's small. It's only for 40 people, and I understand that it's during the day, so there are a lot, a lot of conflicts. So let's see how that works, all right? And then you give me feedback uh, of whether you found it appropriate or not. Okay, um, you see the outline? I have it up there. We'll do a summary from um, last our last lecture, and then we'll cover the, these topics that you see. So last lecture, we talked uh, extensively about a, um, bringing a, conduct, a conductor into a uniform electric field. In the beginning, we started like that, and we said, if you have a uniform electric field and you bring a conductor into it, then what happens if you bring a, a conductor like that? Let's assume that the field, both the field and the conductor are infinite long. And let's assume that the field is uniform and the conductor also has the same thickness uh, independent of um, coordinates. And it's perpendicularly um, placed to the direction of the electric field. Then we said, in this case, what is going to happen is that the free electrons inside the conductor will move under the influence of the electric field, and the electrons will come here. And the positive charges that are left which are in fact atoms or anion, uh, ions, <laughs> ions that are positively charged, will go up there. And so the field inside here, so these charges are ex exactly on the surface, all right? So the field inside here is zero, but the field outside has remained the same. All right, so this is for that particular case. And so we say here we have a plus Q and here we have a minus Q, okay? Then we said if we go away from this problem, which is an ex uh, it's a, um, a problem well described in Cartesian coordinates, and we go to a different problem where we have the same field, uniform, but we place a spherical, solid conductor and or a spherical conductor, maybe it's a shell only, not just a, a sphere. And if we place this here, let me place the conductor. Oops, I'm sorry. I do that all the time, <coughs> apologize. Um, then what happens is the lines will change. So there will be charges, obviously, negative charges here, positive charges here. And the lines which will change so to be perpendicular to the metal. So they will look like this. 
and they will look like this. And these ones may look like this. And some other ones here will look like this, all right? For every one that goes in, there's going to be one coming out like this. And this one here. And the field here is going to be uh, zero. And of course, the field here is disturbed around the uh, spherical conductor. But um, the lines, in fact, have to specifically be perpendicular, the electric field lines perpendicular to the conductor. And why is that? Because the tangential component of the electric field on a conductor is zero. Okay. And then we talked about, we went to another problem where now we have the charge inside the conductor. So let's assume that the conductor has a, it's a shell with a thickness. And there is a charge here. And let's assume that the charge is um, negative for now. That's what we did last time. And then we said that I the charge without the conductor is here. If we have a charge without the conductor, then the electric field is going to look li like this, radial, all right, uniform. And of course, it's going to vary along the uh, R direction, along the radial direction, by how much? If it is a charge Q in free space, minus Q, how uh, fast? will the electric field vary away from the charge in three dimensions? Exactly, one over r squared. Okay, so it changes ac uh, along the r direction, but it's radial. Okay, so there is a spherical symmetry. That's how we call that. So here, we bring a spherical conductor. We do not disturb the spherical symmetry because still this is at the center of the spherical conductor. And therefore, inside this one, what is this going to do is to create positive charges They will be here. And these positive charges will sustain the um, field here. So the, it will sustain the spherical symmetry of the field. And because of these positive charges, there will be electrons here. <coughs> which will accumulate on the external exterior surface of the conductor. And they have to be such that the electric field inside the conductor is zero. All right? And because the field outside, so these ones will create a field outside that looks like this. Because of the spherical symmetry, the field outside will be along the radial direction. And for the outside will be like the field has been extended. But of course, the charges here will be distributed over the, surf uh, the spherical surface, and that is going to radiate. Yes. Yes, sorry. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. OK, so the field is going to be an extension. The ex external field is going to be an, an extension of the internal field. Now, if we take this one and place it connected with the ground, then what is going to happen? What the ground is like a big pool yeah. of electrons and charges in general, right? So what is going to happen with all of these electrons that are here? They will flow to the ground, all right? It's like a big pool, if you think of. Uh, if you were in circuits, it's like you have a very low resistance. The electrons will flow wherever there is low resistance. 
and then it all goes here, which means what is going to happen to these ones? They will all go away. Another way is instead of electrons flowing in one way direction, you may say, well, um, depends you know, on what kind of uh, ground you have. You may say, well, positive charges will come over here. And then um, instead of electrons flowing, people say, no, positive charges will come up. And then they will cancel the negative charges. So the potential of this outside surface is 0. It's exactly the same with the potential of the ground, which then means what? that the outside does not radiate, OK? But this is a very important piece. Now, do you know of any applications where this happens? Have you seen the cables we are using uh, for TV? There are some thick cables that they come back and you connect it. These are coaxial cables. They're like this. And then there is a dielectric to keep the, this is a small conductor, and there are cylindrical. So you can s consider instead of a spherical, pro uh, in spherical coordinates, a problem in cylindrical coordinates. So there are two long conductors, one at the center, one outside. For this one, the outside conductor, of, co of course, is important because you would like the charges to keep the radiated field contained in the volume. And that one, the only reason that does not radiate is because it's grounded. Otherwise, if it was not grounded, it would radiate. And it would be a different, another conductor with charge that was radiating. I mean, radiating meaning exciting in stat is statics now, right? Because radiation really means a, a time varying field. But in statics, creating, so you will have charges that will create a static electric field outside. And then that, uh, in high frequencies, applies the same thing. Of course, the coaxial in, um, the TVs, in all of these that you have the coaxial connections behind, all of those are higher frequencies. But the same thing applies to higher frequencies. All right, so you really need to um, remove the charges from the outer shell to be able to make sure that your uh, field has been contained. Any questions so far? Yes? No. Not in this case. It would have been in the other one without this present. Yes? Here, remains. This is zero here, non zero here, obviously. Yes? No, no, they stay. They stay because of that. OK, so the, your homework is very similar to that. This is just offset a little bit. And so I wanted you to calculate. Um, you're going to solve the problem in spherical coordinates. All right, I gave you the position of the charge in spherical coordinates. And then um, tomorrow we'll solve some similar problems to see how we go down to equations and how we, uh, we do those things. All right, so today. We are going to go to dielectrics. Since we spoke about conductors, now we have to talk about dielectrics and see what happens. Let me ask you the following. Um, when are those, we have a lot of, uh, we have flow of electrons. We have movement of electrons, all right? We have movement of positive ions in conductors. And in, in ideally, that movement does not require any, any energy, all right, ideally. But in reality, every time you move an electron from one position to another, <coughs> you have to provide energy into the system. So um, what happens in reality? How do we take, without any specific equations, but how do we take into account the energy we have to provide, so all of this movement of the charges takes place. What happens in reality and accounts for that phenomenon that we have to spend energy 
to be able to move charges around. We call that losses. What it means is part of the energy we give in the system, the electrostatic energy, converts into losses in the conductor. All right? Ideal conductors do not have that. You can freely move charges, no problem. But in real conductors and every other material, you have to uh, place energy to move conductors, uh, to move uh, uh, charges. And so you waste part of your energy that you put into the system. And that goes into losses. And that's why we, we calculate those losses later in our circuit design, because many times uh, those losses can be very high especially if you go away from statics and you go to high frequencies, the higher the frequency, the higher those losses. So the more energy you need to give to these electrons to move around. And as they move, not only you put energy to move them, but also they start, um, they start uh, bumping on each other, losing energy in the process. So all of this is called loss, just so uh, physically you can think about it. OK, now let's assume that we have a dielectric. And um, let's see what happens inside the dielectric. Let's assume that you have a dielectric slab for the moment. All right, no conductor, just a dielectric slab. Inside this dielectric, there are atoms. And um, a very simple representation of an atom is like a nucleus has a nucleus that is positive charged positively charged, and then has the, a number of electrons. The closer the electrons are to the nucleus, the more tight they are. And then the further out, so it depends on how far out you are, you need much less energy to move them around. And um, in this is neutral. So if you don't, if this is in free, uh, if it is in place without an electric field, then the negative charges distribute in such a way that they um, cancel the positive charge, and then this atom looks like neutral. Now, if you place that inside an electric field, Let's keep the nucleus, first of all, here. If you place it inside an electric field, which goes like, um, If you start, if, if you place that in, inside an electric field, what is going to happen is that the negative charges will accumulate in one or another direction depending on how the direction of the electric field goes. So for example, if the electric field here goes like that, well, of course, it's going to be an electric field here, all right? Now, um, this is an exaggeration because, of course, this is one atom. But I wanted to say that they are gonna be, there is going to be a concentration of charge. Some of the free electrons will come here. And then it's going to be a depletion of negative electrons here. So there will be fewer of those. Not all of them will move down here, but there's going to be a depletion here, which means that the symmetry the symmetry that you saw here is going to be uh, modified. And that simplistically, we show it as a dipole. We say, OK, so we have a positive charge up here. So the, the, if you try to balance these two, you see more of a positive charge there, and you see a negative charge here, and we show it like that. All right, just for simplicity. And this is like a dipole. And when you have a, a, a dipole, it's an atomic dipole, ob obviously. You have a positive and a negative charge. And it has the, the same dimensions, very similar to the atom. So 
We have lots of them. If you take this, then practically, uh, without any field applied around, they will look like that. And so forth. They will all be, but in a way that all of this material is neutral. And why are they going to go like that randomly? Because randomly, microscopically, inside the material, a lot of things take place. So the material, for example, may have um, some impurities. And what happens, some of these impurities will capture some of the electrons, so they get trapped there. So if you have an impurity down here, and then you, you, uh, you trap electrons, then obviously that part particular ion is going to become positive to that direction. Then um, for other reasons, you may have defects. And also that may trap some. But uh, the whole thing then reorient itself so it's neutral. When you take this and you put it inside an electric field, then things change. But before we go and start looking at what happens here, let's try to see how we are going to represent this dipole. So this dipole, uh, let's assume that we are in um, this system. I mean, it's either a Cartesian or a um, cylindrical or a spherical, all right? If it's a cylindrical, the z direction is going to be the, the uh, axis of the cylinder. If it is a spherical, this is going to be um, the, uh, the center of the spherical coordinate system. Otherwise, it's a Cartesian. But in this particular case, let's assume that we have one here, charge, positive, and one here, negative. And um, we assume that these two the, the distance from here to the center of the charge is called R1. The distance from here to the center of the other charge is called R2. And then, so th let's assume that the distance between the charges is D. So now um, we are looking at the... at a new entity we call the dipole moment. Moment. The dipole moment is nothing else but the, I will write it here, P is Q. This, this is a plus Q. If you remember, this is a minus Q. Um, and that is times the distance. But distance, because you know you have oriented your two points in space, this distance is going to be a vector. It's not going to only have a value, but it's going to have a direction, and that's why the distance here shows like as a as a vector, and the distance is nothing else but r1 minus r2. All right, so that's why the distance is a vector, and we call this the dipole moment. That's a convention. And therefore, each one of these, we don't anymore carry all of these tiny dipoles inside the material, but we call, we say that we have dipole moments. All right? And they have a specific orientation. Okay. When there is a, um, an electric field, let's take only one of those. For the time being, let's take only one. And let's assume that we had this one here, dipole. And then we have an electric field that applies to the whole dielectric like this. But we only look at this dipole. What is going to happen when you have an electric field, in a, a dipole in an electric field? OK, so I will erase that here. I have everything in my notes, by the way. So if I raise something and you have not had enough time to write it, you will find it in the book. So if I have an electric field that applies like this, what does it do to this system, to this dipole, the electric field? 
is going to apply a torque, all right? So it's going to place a torque that is going to try to move the positive like that and the negative like this. So practically, it's going to try to reorient that dipole along the electric field. <coughs> All right. So this torque is P cross E. And that's the value of it. And then that's what you have to do, what it's going to do. So it reorients eventually. This dipole, therefore, changes some to something like that when uh, there is an electric field that applies like this. OK, yeah? So there was a question. Do one charges spin, and then the one goes in off the load, and then it spins two times the other way? Well, um, this is a macroscopic. So I have to say, this is a very macroscopic view of what happens in a dielectric. If you want to see what happens in reality and whether there is a spin and everything inside the dielectric, then you have to have a much better representation of these dipoles. And we can do that later if you want. But it is true that a lot of times the dipoles will not move like that, but they may start moving like they may do a spin. They may never really stop in one position, but they, they may start, depending on the material, start doing a spin, which means that the dipoles will not orient like this, but they will create small currents like that. OK, but now I think let's leave it out for the time being to be able, because everything we do is macroscopic. And so we are, up, uh, we are accepting models that are not necessarily correct at the microscopic level. OK, yes. Yes. So this is the definition of a torque. All right. So wh what would you like me to do with that? The torque, yes. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about this? That's where it stops. When if P and E become parallel, then the torque goes to 0. So it is non-zero when they are like this. The moment they align, that goes to 0. Any other? OK. So here is 0, here it's not. The moment it moves to this, then it's going to stabilize, for example. So um, we now, having said all of this, what happens is, therefore, inside the material, we have all of these um, dipole moments. And all of these dipole moments will give rise, since they are all small vectors, if we sum them all up, they will give rise to a, a vector we call polarization vector. So if, for example, we take an infinitesimally small so if we take an infinitesimally small volume from here, dv, then um, we define the polarization vector as the sum of all of the um, dipole moments in here. And that is in dv divided by dv. And this is a vector. And it's called the polarization vector. All right, so now let's see what is this polarization vector, um, how helpful it can be to us. The polarization vector primarily can give you, you can find out based on the definition of the polarization vector and the definition of the dipole moment, you can prove that the divergence of the polarization vector is nothing else but the negative of the polarization charge. So now, on the basis of that, 
we can define a polarization chart for the dielectric. <coughs> All right? We can define a polarization chart for the dielectric because all of them align in some ways, and eventually under the, um, the, the electric field, they will create all of these dipole moments and they will be represented by this vector. And on the basis of this, we can define a new charge which is called the polarization chart. Now let's see how we can use the polarization charts because obviously we have defined it to be able to use it effectively, all right? So we go back to a dielectric like this. Okay, um, here is what is gonna happen to this dielectric. Let's try, let's assume at this point that this dielectric was inside has been inside an electric field that all of the dipole moments have aligned and all of the let's assume that the electric field was like that all right we place the dielectric in there and all of the dipole moments have aligned so all of the positive charges from these dipoles are here All of the negative charges from the other dipoles are here. And then let's see what happens in between. This one should have a negative charge here, obviously. It's one of them because they're dipoles. They don't go by themselves. They go in pairs. And then you have another dipole. All of them are aligned. And then, of course, they go in pairs. Up until down here, where also those have positive charges and then go in pairs, all right? The negatives are just at the surface of the dielectric. So practically, what happens is that when I take this area of the dielectric, what I see is that the total charge here is zero, all right? However, I have the surface charges, which is positive here, negative there. And so we can talk about this one, we can talk about the surface polarization charge. And then that's another surface polarization charge. All right? So practically, even if the charges do not move to the surface, but they remain in place, it's just that they have changed the orientation, I still can define a surface polarization charge here and a surface polarization charge there. And because of this relationship, you can prove that at any point on this surface, at any point, the polarization charge right below the surface in the dielectric is um, the same in value with P, with the value of P at that point because of that. Okay? So we'll go a little further to see why would do we need all of this? I mean, the question is, okay, now we understand a little bit of physics here, but why do we need all of this? We need all of this for, so for us to see how are we going to represent macroscopically all of this that is happening here microscopically, all right? Even if we have, again, the models we've used are very simplistic. So the, if I have now a, um, the, uh, let's assume that I, to, to, to get a little bit of a sense of um, what is happening here, let's assume that we take this dielectric and instead of having a free electric field that goes like that, 
we create a similar electric field by putting two metals on each side. Remember when I said, what is an example of an electric field that is uniform and goes like this? I think you uh, suggested it was a capacitor, and which is true. So instead of having this field like that, I would say, okay, let, let, let me try to do the same field by placing a capacitor. So let's assume that I have created this field here by having a capacitor who now, who now has a Q here and a minus Q there. Let me see. So what is going to happen if there is a metal, there are two metal metals, two metal conductors here. Of course, the field inside the conductor is zero, but the field here is going to be non-zero. So practically for this small distance between the metallic conductors, all right, and the dielectric, there is going to be an, an, an external field that is caused by the two metals of the conductor. So here, to just make it a little, uh, this one is the line that separates this air from the dielectric, and this is the lower line that separates also this air or the conductor from the dielectric. So your dielectric is from here to there, so for to be able to um, differentiate it. And then you will find that um, the field in here, which is the total field because of the presence of the dielectric, all right? I, without the dielectric, you will have an electric field, E naught. Because of the dielectric, the total charge here, if you bring those very close, changes, all right? Because now you have not only the surface uh, charge of the conductor, but you have the surface charge of the dielectric that goes very close. And in this particular case, your total surface charge will be sigma of the conductor, which is the surface charge here. And this is the surface charge, let me call it like this, of the dielectric. Um, this is on the dielectric. And this is on the conductor. So um, here, you're going to have that the total electric field is going to be And as a matter of fact, um, th th there is the um, negative sign that I should say probably, because they're all they're all positive here. So, okay, and all negative there. Yeah. All right. So this would allow us then, so I can write the following. Then I can say that the total electric field can be equal, I'm, I'm rewriting this as, I'm rewriting the surface polarization charge as x, let me see, I don't know, sp. I'm writing this, um, Not really. So um, the um, the relationship between I wanted to say one thing. The relationship between the conducting charge, which is on the surface of the conductor, and the electric field. Right? Yes. Um, is that a field? Yes. Sigma. Sigma. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Sometimes I write, yeah, I know. 
All right. So you remember the relationship, divergence of D equals Q. All right. And then you remember also, uh, of course, on the surface of the conductor, what you find is, and you, let me say, you remember then that E and D are related through epsilon, all right? Uh, this is in free space. So this was rho of divided by epsilon naught, okay? So. This is, we use either, rho, we use it for uh, um, volume density. Q also can be used either for total charge or for volume density. But usually for volume density, we use rho. All right? And so this is rho sub b. Let me just write it carefully. Rho sub b. If your field is only on the surface, like if you go right in the surface of the conductor, then you can really find out, prove that you're on the surface, your D, all right, as we will see in fact later, is going to be the surface charge, which we here we use sigma, or you can call it rho sub S, all right, or sigma, or sigma conductor, you can see all of this. I'm using those because wherever you go and read, you will see that people will use that or they will use this. They are both the same. Surface charge, when you see sigma surface charge. Divided, in fact, epsilon B, divided by, on the surface, okay, divided by epsilon naught in this case. And because it's on the surface of the conductor, this is going to be a surface charge divided by epsilon naught. So practically, on the surface of the conductor, you see a relationship between the surface charge and the electric field on the surface. So we can use this to write a similar relationship between the electric field on the surface due to the polarization current. And of course, not epsilon naught, but a different entity. So practically, we can rewrite this one into the following. That epsilon total, which is the, 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 the um, total field from the conductor plus the field from the polarized dielectric, this is going to be equal to sigma on the conductor, surface on the conductor, surface charge on the conductor, minus this entity times epsilon naught E total divided by epsilon naught. And then from here, all right, from here you can rewrite the electric field as E total from here equal, in fact, uh, equal surface initial charge of the conductor, but divide it now, epsilon naught, one plus x. Okay, why am I doing all of this? To see the following, now I'm gonna summarize everything. To introduce the only, this only thing is done to introduce this entity, chi, all right? So now let's try to Summarize. When I have a conductor, let me remove now the dielectric. And let me go to the initial um, capacitor. I have now All right, electric field. And let us assume that I, um, this is the electric field E naught. When I place a dielectric here and I fill the whole space with a dielectric, what happens is the lines may remain the same, all right? But here the material 
because of these dipole moments, has accumulated more starts into the surface. And as a matter of fact, what it has done is to reduce the total surface starts by the polarization surface starts, like here. And therefore, the electric field in this case, E, the total, is, is going to be smaller than the um, in initial electric field by 1 plus x. And what we do in this particular case is, instead of leaving this 1 plus x by itself, we say that we, now this dielectric that has the dipole moments, we will characterize it by what we call a dielectric, a, a permittivity, epsilon, which is then, is going to be the product of the free space permittivity times one plus chi, which is susceptibility. It's called dielectric susceptibility. And the whole thing here, or this one, is called epsilon r. And finally, the epsilon of dielectric is epsilon r times epsilon naught. So the whole thing is for us to see that this dielectric is going to have a different dielectric permittivity. Yes? Yes, um, this is the electric field on the surface. This is the electric field everywhere. So in the, the electric field on the surface is related to the um, charge on the surface through this relationship, only on the surface. Here, where just underneath it, eventually you put the dielectric, all right, the surface of the conductor. So you have the following problem. An initial capacitor with two conductors and conducting charges, all right, minus, in fact, the way we have it here, it's a minus two here and a plus two here. This is initial charge. You can um, then have surface charge. The surface charge is nothing else but if you have a total charge Q divided by the area, the surface area of the conductor, that gives you the surface charge. So you have a surface charge here and a surface charge there, obviously, for the conductor. But as you introduce the dielectric, you create an opposite polarization charge here, all right, which uh, changes the total charge on the surface. And therefore, your total electric field is going to be given by that. OK, which in fact helps us then introduce this parameter, epsilon sub r. Yes? This is for free space. This is the total. And this is chi. And the total field eventually becomes that only in this particular case. Why is that? Because the, when you have a capacitor, the electric field in between the two places of the capacitor is not only um, it's uniform, not only along this direction, but along that direction, say, has a constant value. So if the field is here is 6 volts per meter, for example, the um, field down here will be the same. The field in here is going to be the same. And that happens in a capacitor when the plates are very large and the plates are very close to each other. And you don't have what we say edge effects. All right? Yes. Sigma 
enthalpy is the surface polarization charge. You remember when I put the dielectric in there and I said that practically when you put a dielectric inside an electric field and you align, align all the dipole moments, then it seems like on the top uh, surface of the dielectric there is a surface polarization charge and that on the lower surface of the dielectric is the opposite surface polarization charge. So still the whole material is neutral, is neutral, but the moments have been aligned to show, to create something like a capacitor, where you have a charge accumulated here and the opposite charge accumulated there. And that's what happens to the dielectric when you enter it in, here, in there. Yes. Because on this, because of the on the surface of the conductor, without the dielectric, this is E naught. All right, without the dielectric, this is E naught. It's the surface, the, the initial charge on the surface of the conductor divided by epsilon naught. Okay, so that that's what it is. Uh, the reason we did this, it may be a little intense, but the reason we did this is just so that you um, see practically how we end up introducing this entity, which is a macroscopic entity for the dielectric. It does not describe microscopic effects, but it gives the overall impact on the dielectric of the application of an electric field. And this number, epsilon sub bar, later you will see it can change here. Of course, we are statics. We have not introduced any losses. It's a real number. But when we go into dynamic fields, you will see that an epsilon sub bar can, e can, be an, um, can have a part, a component that gives you the value of the field, but also another component smaller that gives you the losses in the material. And that's what this allows us to do. And by doing this, we can reuse the formulas we found for free space for a dielectric. All right? Okay. Um, so if all of this sounds a little, a little confusing, the one thing that I want you to remember is this at the end. And physically, that when you put a dielectric inside a conductor, it effectively reduces the surface charge of the conductor. That's what I want you to remember. Yes. Then we are going to do that later when we find the boundary conditions between air and dielectric. So macroscopically, we'll solve that. Still, still, what happens is, even if the dielectric is half, it will still have a polarization charge, all right? That is going to be opposing this one. And um, then you will have to find, you will see how we will find the fields easily there by applying boundary conditions. Okay. Now, um, having said that, what we are going to do is the following. Before we go to the boundary conditions, We are going to talk a little bit about um, about uh, image theory that you have seen before, I'm sure. We'll just remember image theory on conductors, all right? Where, what happens when you have a charge in front of an infinite uh, perfect conductor? Have you seen that before, the image theory? Yes or no? OK. So we're going to just review it, and then we're going to solve a few problems. All right. All right, what happens, um, let's remember what we've seen before. What happens if I have a charge Q?
And that is in plan at a distance, say, d, from a, uh, from a perfect conductor. This is perfect conductor. What do we know about the, um, let's try to draw the electric field lines, first of all. How will they go? If the charge was by itself, the field lines will all be radial, all right? And they will go like 1 over r squared. When I place this metal, what is going to happen to these lines? They will have to bend, so they all terminate on the metal at a 90 degree. So they will go, if I then, let me take this, uh, will go like this, 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 and so forth. Okay, and what is going to happen to th the tangential field here? Zero. All right. How are we going to now, image theory tells us the following, that we can produce the electric field in region one by removing the conductor, so we have the charge, We remove the conductor, but at a distance wh which was here, and then at a, the same distance from here, so if this is D, at a D distance, we put what? A negative charge. And then that works like, operates like a dipole. And how does it go? We'll go like this. So, if I were to throw this away, and after I make the calculations of the dipole, I keep only this part, that will be identical with that one. All right? What happens if I have a charge in front of a corner? That is a question. Think about this because we're going to do this in um, with top hat. Okay, so let's try to do that. Okay. Oh, by the way, this is what I received from you uh, from the about times for the problem solving session. All right, that's why I put it from three ten to five. See that? Okay. Let's um, do this. Okay. This is uh, exactly what I gave you. The charge, if you see in front of a corner. And then it asks you to find the values of these other charges. So I will assign it to you now and then go and do it. And I will remove this for a moment so you don't see what I see. <laughs> And you have like uh, five minutes for those.
You have one more minute. One more. Okay, are you ready? Those who have not entered your numbers yet, please do, fast. Okay, I'm gonna unassign it. Okay, let's see how it looks. Oops. Okay, it's the first answer. What happens? So let's try to solve it here. You solve this problem, you're gonna do it with superposition. All right, and why are we gonna do it with superposition? We said we can superimpose electric field. All right, so practically you extend this, you make them infinite long. So this here has to have a minus Q. This here has to have a minus Q. And 
to be able to preserve the boundary conditions, this has to have a cube. All right? So you solve this problem, but at the end, you only keep this one. Remember. Because inside the conductor, everything is zero. So that's what the image theory for this case. All right, let's now do another one. And the next one um, is going to be on the torque. So it gives you um, different dipole moments and electric fields, and it asks you a particular question about where, what, which field arrangement and, and dipole will exert a torque, or which field will exert a torque on a dipole from these cases, all right? So I'm going to assign it now, and then um, you can enter it, and you have five minutes. And that's exactly the torque we spoke about for the electric field and the dipole moment, or the torque the electric field applies on the dipole moment. Okay, um, one more minute.
Um, D is a, D, it's a um, displacement vector, all right? And this impact in, pre, in, in any medium is gonna look like this. If you wanna write the displacement vector in, in terms of the polarization vector, then, so let me write this uh, for every medium. And for every medium, let me also uh, simplify. For every medium, then D will be epsilon E. Now, this is whether you have the electric in there, free space, and so forth. If you wanna write it separately, then you are gonna have um, D equals epsilon naught E plus P. All right, where P is a polarization vector. So, P and D are vectors that have the same kind, they, they are similar phenomena, all right? So they are, um, this is a flux density, this is a flux density, but this flux density here comes out of, um, it's for a field that is generated by a charge Q. This, this flux density, which we call the polarization vector, is from a field that is generated by the alignment of the dipole moments. But uh, the relationship between D and current, uh, charge, excuse me, and P, in this case, is gonna be a total charge. And P and charge are the same. So, Divergence of D equals rho sub V for a total charge and divergence of P minus rho um, polarization. Okay. They are two relationships that hold. This is um, the flux that is generated if you have a polarization charge. And this is the flux that is generated if you have a total charge. Usually, why do I say total? Because here you only have polarization charge, and then in this particular case, you may have a superposition of polarization and another charge. All right? So uh, the, these are both true, these relations. These D and P are the same types of um, vectors, and physically they show uh, flux density. But we call that polarization vector. From this point on, we are not gonna use this uh, because we are going to put everything into the form of E, and then this epsilon, or epsilon I should call it, and this epsilon is gonna involve both um, the polarization charge and whatever other charges you had in free space before the dielectric was introduced. So if you have a, a space full of dielectric, then epsilon will be epsilon sub r, epsilon naught where epsilon sub r is one plus chi, all right? And if the dielectric goes away and chi goes away, then it is just epsilon naught. Okay, now let us try to um, Let us try to go and look at the um, boundary conditions on the surface of a dielectric because a lot of times you don't have, I think, let me see what, what time is. A lot of times you don't have um, just a volume of dielectric or a slab, but you may have uh, different boundaries. And then the question is how do you Okay, 
let's assume that we have an interface between F and dielectric. And this is going to be epsilon r, epsilon naught. And then we have an, this is region one, and this is region two. And then here we have an electric field. We have E1, E1, and D1. And then here we have E2 and D2. And what is the relationship between E1 and D1? That D1 equals epsilon naught E1. And then here D2 equals epsilon E2. All right, how are we going to find what happens at the interface? There are the following two um, equations that we have which hold true in addition to those for both media separately. We have the divergence of D1 is going to be, of course, if we don't have accumulated charges anywhere, all right, we just have fields that have been excited. There are charges very far away. We don't have any charges here on the interface. Then anywhere around this interface or any part of the interface is going to be zero because there are no charges. And then also we have that the curve of the electric field is zero. Why is that? Because it's electrostatic. All right, we only have charges to create an electric field. Also, we have that the divergence of D2 is zero. All right, so all of uh, everything has been incorporated here. We don't have any charges anymore. We have in incorporated all of the polarization effects into this. So no charges anymore. And kern of E2 is zero. So let's start. There are two theorems we are going to use here. This is called the divergence theorem. And then it says that if I take the volume integral of the divergence of a vector, say d1 or 2, this is going to be the closed surface integral of the vector, that dx. OK? And in fact, let me just remove the 1 and 2 right now. Just uh, This is true for every d. Uh, that's the divergence theorem. Do you remember the Stokes theorem? Do you remember that? That says that if I take the surface integral of the curl of a vector, This is how, what? Equal to the closed line integral of V dot DL. All right? This is the Stokes theorem. Stokes. OK. So uh, what do I do now? I will go and apply this to but here on a very small area. And then, in fact, let me start with the Stokes theorem. I will consider this closed uh, line, in fact, which is the um, perimetry of this surface, S. This is S. And this is um, L1. L2, and I will assume that these are going to zero. They are very small, like dH, dH. OK, if I take, if I take as a um, path, all right, this one, the closed path here, then what it becomes. It goes from um, across the path L1 of 
E one dot L is zero here, all right, because that goes to zero and there is no discontinuity. There are no charges or anything, no currents or anything on this interface. So they if that goes to zero, then the field will go to zero. And then plus L two E two dot DL and again zero on this side. So this gives me the following E one tangent tangential component because that's what it gives me along this direction minus E two tangential component and that um, times whatever length is that L equals zero which tells me that E one T equals E two T. And therefore, at any point on the interface, the tangential components of the electric fields are equal. Okay? So then, we are gonna, instead of the um, surface integral, which we did for the Stokes theorem, I'm gonna go here and do a volume integral. I will do it a little further down here. The volume integral is going to be like this, I will do it, like a small a small volume like that. And I will call this surface S1, this is surface S2, the um, direction for S1 is N1. The direction for S2 is N2, and I will assume that these thicknesses go to zero, the heights of this dh. In that case, then, I can take um, this volume integral here is going to turn into a closed surface integral on all of the surfaces. And then um, it's going to be the following. Um, so surface integral on S1 D1 dot DS plus surface integral on S2 um, and then D2 dot DS. And then we have the surface integrals on all of the surfaces which are going around. But because DH goes to zero, those integrals will eventually go to zero. All right, so all of the integrals around these surfaces where DH goes to zero will go to zero. So finally, we have only this, which is zero, and that gives us, this is the inner product between this surface, the vector, this is N1, so it's going to be D N1, and then N2 goes to the opposite direction, so minus D N2 equals zero, which gives us the other boundary condition that says the normal component of DN1 equals to the normal component of DN2. And these are the two boundary conditions across the dielectric if there are no charges on the interface. All right? So with that, Somebody then can solve the problem, whoever asked, of how we solve problems if we have dielectrics inside capacitors that do not go all the way up to the surface. All right? And um, I w we are going to solve problems on that um, next time because now we don't have time to solve this. But we are going to use exactly these boundary conditions to solve these problems.
Ah, uh, Git one zero zero six. Which uh, Git call. Git call one zero zero six. And it's at three o'clock. Three ten to five. Three ten. Git call one zero zero six. Okay.